This is Asian Insider and I'm Nirmal Kosh. Now on the 1st of February, Myanmar's army, the Tatmadaw, claiming widespread fraud in the November 8 election, seized power in a coup d'etat, hours before the new parliament was due to sit. The Tatmadaw arrested state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi and President Widmet, among others in the National League for Democracy, the NLD, along with an unknown number of civil political activists. The Tatmadaw has declared a one-year state of emergency and says that after that, there will be another election. Meanwhile, they are charging Do Aung San Suu Kyi with violating import restrictions for some walkie-talkies, reportedly. And that could be the excuse to put her back in jail. Now, the NLD won 396 out of 476 seats in the election. Myanmar has been in a hybrid form of democracy, which still left the military in a very powerful position, controlling a big bloc in parliament and key ministries. So the question is, why seize power now? Is, is this the end of Myanmar's fragile experiment with democracy? To discuss these and other questions, I have on the line today author and historian Dr. Tant Min U and International Crisis Group advisor on Myanmar, Richard Horsey. Good to see you both today. Good to see you, Nima. Hi, Nima. So, Tant, Tant, if I may start with you and welcome back to Asian Insider. Is this coup as much about personalities and power as about the perceived national interest? Well, a coup is definitely about power and the military has seized power. That's, there's no question of, of that. It's to some extent about personality. Um, we know that over the past few years, the relationship between the army commander in chief and the state councilor to Aung San Suu Kyi has not been good. It's certainly not been close. It's not been a close working relationship. So we can only assume that uh, their personalities have clashed to some extent and, and it hasn't been um, a friendly kind of cohabitation in this government, which as you said, involved uh, both the army and, and the National League for Democracy headed by Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, I think both have their own sense of what the national interest is. I mean, for Aung San Suu Kyi, the national interest was very much about uh, moving towards a new constitution, which enshrined elected civilian government uh, presiding over the armed forces or directing the armed forces. Uh, whereas the army has a very, very different sense of where its legitimacy comes from and, and what the national interest should be. And, and of course, it's very much sectored on, centered on, on their long history of counterinsurgency and their feel that the army has to be the guardian of the nation. So there's that as well. But I think like all things in Myanmar, there's a the whole set of very complex circumstances and dynamics that, that led to this present coup, which I don't think was inevitable until the hours or, or days at least uh, leading up to it on Monday. Richard, uh, this was predictable for anyone really following the events in Myanmar over the last month or so, or even before that. But it nevertheless came as a jolt to many in the international community, and not least in the United States, where we have just had a transition over here. Now, several generals are already under sanctions from the U.S. There are people calling for broader sanctions, but there is also a recognition that broad sanctions never really worked and only hit ordinary people. So now, what options does the West in general and the United States in particular have in dealing with this issue? I think the honest answer is that nobody has very many good options if the objective is returning to something like the situation before the coup with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, in power and sharing that power with the army. Um, you know, this isn't going to be reversed, uh, you know, through international pressure or, or, or at all. Um, but then the question is, well, what should the reaction be? Uh, and is there any objective short of reversing the coup that can be achieved? And I think uh, that's where, you know, questions of sanctions and pressure and intervention come in. Um, you know, the challenge also is that the West's leverage is not as it was uh, a generation ago. Uh, and so the West can't just roll out the kind of uh, uh, policies that it might have, uh, have, have used uh, um, the last time the military was in power. Those didn't work very well uh, anyway. So I think the risk here is that short of any good ideas about how to actually positively impact the situation in Myanmar, uh, Western policymakers will revert to sanctions because they uh, demonstrate, uh, they have a demonstration effect, they show uh, unhappiness and, uh, uh, with the situation, uh, they're very easy to put in place. Um, and, and, and that's kind of the problem with sanctions, right? They're a convenient substitute 
for a policy where there is no obvious uh, other other options. And we've been here before. What ends up happening is that you know at first it's it's a quite targeted set of sanctions, but then as the regime does things that, uh, that, that cause concern, um, as the situation deteriorates, there is then a call for stricter sanctions, and we're on a slippery slope to much more generalized uh, trade and investment sanctions that in the past had a very serious uh, impact, negative impact on the population and on the economy, and no impact at all uh, on the leadership. And I think the risk is that we get into that dynamic again, uh, and I think there needs to be a lot of caution uh, about going beyond sanctions that are targeted to individuals and specific institutions uh, to more sort of trade and investment sanctions. But in a sense, this question uh, is also a little bit moot because, you know, the real impact of this is going to be on investors, on uh, consumers in the West who are not going to want to do business with Myanmar. And that effect will be much stronger than any sanctions, I think. Right. Uh, Tant, you, I saw that you tweeted recently about this, about the international response. And, you know, I think you were referred, in fact, to what are your thoughts on that? Could you elaborate a bit on your tweets? No, I think it's, it's quite right, as Richard said. It's going to be very difficult and, and probably not the right thing for Western governments or Western democracies or, or countries in general to, to pretend that business as usual is, is the right thing or, or is even going to be possible. And there's going to be I think at least some sort of limited sanctions um, further down the road, if not, if not over the coming days. If they're very targeted sanctions, and we already have targeted sanctions in place, I think the impact will be minimal perhaps on the economy and will almost certainly have zero impact in terms of the new army administration's uh, political thinking going forward. But any broader sanctions, trade sanctions, banking sanctions, the kind that we had in the, in the 2000s, I think it could be catastrophic for the economy. It's possible that it might have some pressurizing effect on the, on the army administration, but this is an economy that's already a tipping point. I mean, we are in a COVID pandemic. We are in a global economic downturn. The impact of that on, on Myanmar has been acute. Uh, millions, perhaps tens of millions of people have been thrown into to poverty. Uh, millions of people have been moving around looking for jobs over the past few years. Um, I think that you know any sort of economic sanctions that might have an impact politically are going to be the same economic sanctions that again has the, has the possibility of throwing the country into this kind of tailspin. And I think on the other side of that could be a Myanmar that's just ungovernable generally. I think we have to be very careful in terms of, of how we use these very sort of blunt instruments. I think we also have to be aware, I mean, just going back to your original question and, and thoughts, Nirmal, is that you know, how fragile this whole opening has been over this past 10 years. And what we're seeing right now is the end of an experiment between the army and uh, Dawn San Suu Kyi after 20 years of, of her being in, under house arrest, a political prisoner and everything else campaigning against the military dictatorship. We've seen, we're seeing the end of the experiment in some kind of compact, some kind of accommodation of, of one another uh, and a shared government. So what comes next, I think is, is really anyone's guess at this point. And I think what we need to do in general is to go back to the proverbial sort of drawing board and, and really think through things from first principle in terms of what's really going to lead to, to democracy and a, and a better life for, for people in, in Myanmar. Yes, yeah, important not to lose sight of uh, people in Myanmar. So, um, yeah, in, in, uh, in the context of the geopolitics, so we are seeing China characteristically neutral, returning to its old um, role, so to speak. And we have seen concern from India, concern from ASEAN. What are the options for them? Tant, if I may stay with you for that question. You wrote a book on the subject, where China and India meet, right? Uh, could I, you know, what, what I is your take? You know, I think it's unlikely that regional countries will, will reach for just sanctions. I think it's almost impossible in the case of, of most, if not all, countries in the, in the region. I think some, all of them in, in, in different ways, at least the major powers, China, India, Japan, I think we'll be very concerned. All have tried very hard over the past few years to cultivate good ties with, with Aung San Suu Kyi. All of them had different hopes, South Korea as well, for stronger economic ties, stronger diplomatic uh, relations with the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi II uh, administration. I think all of them will be also surprised by the turn of events, perhaps not over the past few weeks, but certainly over the past few months that it's come to this point. And, and all will probably be thinking exactly what to do. I'm not sure anyone has a 
strategy on, on what to do next. I think the default, if we go into a, a situation where there's be some Western sanctions, where there's much worse relations between Myanmar and, and many countries um, in the democratic world, uh, where the army is, is trying desperately to, to kind of stabilize the situation, fend off uh, opposition, protests, um, and deal with uh, all the huge challenges in the country, I think the country that's most likely to kind of fill a vacuum, to, to fill the space needed in terms of economic support ties as back in the 90s and 2000s is China. Except this time around, China is you know 10 times richer and, and more powerful. I think China will also be extremely keen to make sure that uh, there is an instability in the country. And they believe that they have, you know, any instability will have a direct impact, negative impact on, on them. Um, and India as well, which has a huge border where we've seen much closer army to army cooperation over the past few years. I think India will be also very uh, worried about future instability in the country. So in India's case, I think a return to democracy would also be part of the agenda in the way that it wouldn't be necessarily for China. But I think that um, this, this worry about instability will also be high on, on India's mind as well. And quickly, while on that subject, and I'll stay with you, Tan, for just another moment, uh, the China aspect is, is it somewhat exaggerated? So th there's this theory that U.S. pressure, Western pressure will drive Myanmar into China's arms and so forth. That's an exaggeration, isn't it? It's to some extent an exaggeration. I think what we have to know is that, or what we have to remember is that economic ties with China have, have continued over these past, um, and strengthened over these past several years or, or decade or, or more not because of BRI, Belt Road Initiative projects, not because of big government uh, to government schemes, very few of which have actually gotten off the ground, but just because of the sheer weight of China's economic gravity, as I mentioned, you know, China's 10 times richer than it was you know, in very recent history, right. Myanmar has remained extremely poor. And so just the fact that the border is open, there's trade means that this economic integration is happening in a way that's extremely beneficial to, to China. And it means that thousands and thousands of different Chinese individual firms and companies, some state-owned, some private, are, are now setting up shop in, in different ways across Myanmar. And so those ties will, will deepen anyway, I think, regardless of, of what happens to the point where you know, Myanmar's economy may become extremely um, uh, subservient to, to, chi to China's. Uh, if there are significant Western sanctions, that will only uh, sort of quicken that process. I don't think it's going to cause it. I think it's simply going to quicken a dynamic that's already there of, of regional integration generally and, and Myanmar's regional integration uh, under yeah. China's wing specifically. Uh, Richard, the regime is now facing civil disobedience. There's been this clamor of pots and pans in Yangon, all kinds of other activities. It has just shut down Facebook. It says for one week, but we don't know. That means it is moving to cut people off from organizing on Facebook, obviously. But this is a new Myanmar that did not exist before. Uh, so we have seen what the Tapadaw is capable of doing in power. What are we looking at going forward or what should we be worrying about going forward domestically in the situation in Myanmar? You know, I think from what we've seen of the military so far, they want to project a sense of normality, a sense that, you know, apart from the coup, everything else is proceeding as it was before, smoothly, even a little bit better. Um, they've you know, restored internet in Rakhine State that's been cut for uh, more than a year. Um, they've set up new peace architecture, you know, all of these kinds of things. The challenge is going to be that they're not going to have a free hand to do everything they want. There is a, you know, a lot of anger. Uh, in the country um, and that's going to start showing itself how it shows itself is not clear up until now it's been uh, mostly on facebook people uh, you know venting all of their emotions very very openly uh, there's been the banging of pots and pans as you say in, in the evenings uh, there's been strikes by uh, nurses and doctors uh, and other things but you know, as much as the regime might want to just keep things on an even keel, it may not be able to. It may have to respond to, um, to challenges to its power and to demonstrations and organizing in a way that will sort of tip this situation into a downward spiral. I think that's the risk. And then, so although it's been a bloodless coup, uh, you know, at what point will the military feel it has to stamp its authority more firmly on arrested population? I think, you know, that's the question and, and we just don't know. Uh, the answer to that at this stage, I think. Tant, uh, back to you for the last uh, for the last word. Uh, you had expressed some um, pessimism about 
you talk about the dark, uh, dark, potentially dark future. Give us what are what are your fears for Myanmar? Yeah, I, it's it's not a good thing to to, to be pessimistic, and I, I think especially for people in Myanmar, young people in Myanmar, it's, it's always important to hold out some hope that there can be a, a, a better kind of turn of events in the not too distant future. But I think we have to remember that Myanmar is facing, or was facing anyway, tremendous challenges, not just the, the economy and the economic impact of, of, of uh, the COVID crisis that I mentioned before. But as you know, I mean, Myanmar is a country uh, that has faced multiple armed insurrections throughout its history, where we have dozens of different ethnic-based armed organizations, hundreds of of militia, we have huge multi-billion dollar illicit industries. And you know, just around the corner, we also have uh, climate change and what's gonna be a catastrophic impact on Myanmar of climate change. So all of this means that this is the time for, for good government, good governance, uh, legitimate government, government that's supported by people and competent government that's gonna be able to deal with all of these challenges. And it was always gonna be for a country as poor as Myanmar, so isolated, uh, where the education system has been in such a weak state, as well as the healthcare system for, for generations, it was always going to be another uphill climb. And so in many ways, you know, Myanmar is the last country to be able to afford this kind of political crisis at this moment where for everyone in the world, uh, the focus needs to be on the pandemic and, and economic recovery after the pandemic. I think if Myanmar cannot do this, you know, in this key year of 2021, uh, deal with this, you know, the remaining months, hopefully, of the pandemic and, and come out with some kind of economic recovery, um, it's just going to be locked in even more at the bottom of the pyramid in Asia at a time when Asia is, is becoming the center of the world's economy and is becoming regionally more integrated. And I think that that really spells uh, a, a bad future for, for the country. If you, if you layer on top of that the possibility of renewed instability, armed conflict, um, I think you get into a dynamic where, whether it's whether it's the army, whether it's whether it's outside CG, whether it's anybody else, it's, or outside powers, even it's going to be very difficult to control the situation going forward. So it's very much uh, just a last quick one. It's very much in the interest of the Tatmado to get this one year over with and have another election, right? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think the the, the you know if. As I said before, the, you know, the experiment of, of the army and, and also SSG trying to work together is over. The question is, you know, what, what comes next? And I think for, for also SSG and the NLD and for probably most people in the country, the answer would be, you know, free and fair elections, which she almost undoubtedly would win if they happened in a, in a year's time. Uh, and that would be probably unacceptable to the army, which is why they, you know, part of the reason that they staged the coup uh, this week. Uh, but anything that looks like not just a rigged election, but a kind of structured election where they not only have 25% of the seats in the parliament, but maneuver to make sure that either the NLD cannot participate or she cannot participate in some way, I think that would be unacceptable then to her and to, to the NLD and, and maybe to, to you know, millions of, of, of her followers as well. So we're in this kind of stalemate. I'm not sure that there's any quick, um, even if the military wanted to, I'm not sure there's a a quick exit from this towards um, towards a more stable uh, situation. That's also something that's you know on the on the path to to, to democracy in the future. Right, Richard. Uh, if I may just end with you on you know a quick, very quick question and a very quick answer. If I may, are you optimistic? What are the grounds for optimism? Is there are there any grounds for optimism? Look, it's uh, the only thing I think we can be optimistic about is that we're not in a worst case scenario. I mean, this has so far been a bloodless coup. Uh, the military doesn't seem to be intent on remaking the entire country, the economy, the ideological basis of governance. Uh, they, they have a fairly limited uh, set of objectives around, you know, who runs the country and how power is shared. Um, that's the only thing to be slightly less pessimistic about, but I'm not optimistic at all. Richard Jose, Tantmintu, thank you very much. I know it's a very busy time and a very anxious time as well. Thank you very much for joining us on Asian Insider today. So as we've heard, the coup d'etat came at the worst possible time for Myanmar. And it also poses a massive challenge for the international community, for Myanmar's immediate neighbors, as well as for the West, and especially the United States. It must be handled with the finesse and the wants necessary to ensure that the people of Myanmar do not suffer more than they are already. For Asian Insider, I'm Nirmal Ghosh.